Good morning. Welcome to worship. Um, Psalm 117 is categorised as a universal call to worship. And it's also a hymn of praise. It just happens to be the shortest chapter in the Bible, and it's also the middle chapter. So it's uh, just a psalm that Paul quotes in Romans to show God's salvation is for all people, not just for those people of Israel. And it's a great way for us to begin our service this morning. Let's share in the psalm together. Praise the Lord, all ye nations. Extol him, all ye people. For great is his love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Shall we pray? In darkness of night and the brightness of day, you, O Lord, are present to us. As we wrestle with situations which seem to drain us of our energy, as we struggle to find out who you call us to be, you reach out to us with reassurance of empowerment and courage for the days ahead. Calm our spirits and prepare our hearts and lives to receive your awesome grace. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Our first hymn this morning uh, encourages us as brothers and sisters in Christ to continue to praise God, proclaiming the good news for all people everywhere to hear. Let's stand together as we sing.
Shall we pray? Lord of mercy and hope, we come before you with fear in our hearts. We know that we have fallen short of being the kind of disciples that you have called us to be. We have often turned our backs on the people in need. We have closed our ears to the cries of the voiceless. Remind us again, O oh God, that you are a merciful God, and your love transforms and changes our lives. When we falter and slide off the path of hope that you place before us, you pick us up, and you dust us off, and you put us back on our feet, confident of your faithful presence with us. Forgive us our weaknesses, strengthen us and give us courage. Help us to be bearers of your good news and peace to all that we meet. We pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. This next worship song is uh, one that reminds us that God is faithful with us forever. It is a more modern song. We have sung it here before. I'm sure that you'll uh, do well in singing it again. Join with me as we sing about our faith. for us to praise the Lord for the countless gifts that he's given to us of love that we receive day by day. Join me as we sing.
God's election of Israel. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. This week I tried to blend a few Bible verses together, and it didn't seem to work <laughs> in my message. And then I've been listening to a few podcasts of late, well I do that all the time, but some political ones seem to be what I'm going to at the moment. And um, I don't know about you, but I've been following the Middle East challenges at the moment. I'm not sure if anyone else has heard that there's not been a lot of it in the news in Australia, but it's all over these podcasts that I've been listening to, so it sparked my interest. Um, the region, as always, is in a very vulnerable state, and this is, of course, due to the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict that dates back to the end of the 19th century. However, violence has escalated this year, and the West Bank uh, is on track for its deadliest year since 2005, after the approval of over 5,000 Israeli settler homes to be built uh, before the end of the year, sparking much of this new violence to erupt. In addition to this, Israel is now in a new crisis, and it seems especially shocking because uh, no one saw it coming just a couple of months ago. Just a few weeks ago, the World Happiness Report found that Israel was fourth happiest country in the world to live in. Have a guess where we were in Australia. We were 12th. That's not too bad, they're top 20. It's good. However, in recent weeks, uh, the relatively new right-wing coalition government in Israel have been presiding over the astonishing breakdown of Israeli politics, its economy and this contentious judicial reform have now sparked enormous nationwide riots. Um, some political commentators are suggesting that this could be the lead into a civil war. <coughs> In his book, in 2013, uh, My Promised Land, Ari Shevitz states that there is no nation quite like Israel. There are many reasons for his claim. However, two in particular define the author's deeply personal perspective on this issue about modern Israel, occupation and intimidation. He writes, in 21st century, there is no other nation that is occupying another people as we do and there is no other nation that is intimidating, that is intimidated as we are. Israel has always lived with this existential fear as a profoundly vulnerable group of 6 million Jews flanked on all sides by 1.5 billion Muslims. The Jewish immigration settlement strategy is one born of paranoia and confirmed by history. Israel's story is one full of ambiguity, littered with triumphs and tragedy in equal measure. The triumph of Israel is obvious. After 3,000 years of history, after exodus and exile, annihilation and assimilation, ancient Jews have a modern state. About 40% of all Jewish people live in Israel, 40% in the US, and the rest are scattered around the world. The moral tragedy is also obvious, with the detention camps keeping Palestinians who have been forcibly removed from their homes behind razor wire fences, segregating the country in, and its inhabitants. So what then is ancient Israel and modern Judaism? How can the Jew stay Jewish in a non-Jewish world? And of course the answer is different for conservative Jews than it is for the reformed Jews than it is radically different for the Reconstructionist Jews, who often are on the outside. Paul was known as the Hebrew of Hebrews, who used to brag that he was more zealous for the Judaism than anyone else. 
Never could he have imagined what his epistle for this week would resonate so much with force uh, of the last couple of thousand years later. In Romans 9 and 2, he writes that he has great sorrow and unceasing grief for his fellow Jews. The ancient Hebrew Bible isn't a blueprint for modern politics, so we can't expect for Paul to foretell about contemporary Israel. And yet, Romans 9 to Romans 11 provokes us to think about what it means for the nation of Israel to be the people of God. Israel began with two different but related covenants. One with Abraham, based in the family and the birthright and the kinship and the chosen people. And the other with Moses, based on the legal covenant, a nation, a law and a people who might well be chosen. However, people who must also freely choose. Paul redefines both Abrahamic and Mosaic covenants in these verses and chapters. Of the Abrahamic lineage, Paul writes, they are not all Israel who are descendants from Israel, neither are they all children because they are of Abraham's descendants. And Paul was famous for his insistence that no person will be justified before God by keeping the Mosaic law alone. Paul writes to the Galatians and to the Colossians, there is neither Jew nor Gentiles, for they are all one in Christ. To the Ephesians, he writes that Jesus made two groups, Jews and Gentiles, one, and that he destroyed the barrier dividing them, and the walls of hostility came down. Paul's thinking obviously comes from Christ's teaching, where he said similar things. Do not think that you can yourselves, we can say for yourselves that we are of Abraham's line. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up descendants and children of Abraham. Many observed Jews of the time complained that Jesus had ignored the Mosaic law and welcomed ritually impure Gentiles. And the first and most divisive flashpoints for the early church, who were considered a sect of the Judaism, was whether Gentiles, whether they were converts and that they could observe the Mosaic law along with the Jews. In whatever period of time, ancient or modern, whatever the political challenges faced, Whatever the theological ambiguities between the followers, Paul insists that the Israel's election as the chosen people of God is irrevocable, and that their divine election came with one specific vocation. When God called Abraham to form the people for himself, he said that they would not bless just the Jewish people, but rather that all the people of the earth. When God repeats his covenant to Isaac, he, re he re reiterates his inclusive love for all of the world. He says, in you, Isaac, all nations on earth will be blessed. And when Jacob used a rock for a pillow and dreamed dreams at Bethel, God again repeated word for word, in Jacob, all people on earth will be blessed. Throughout these last few weeks in the lectionary, we have seen Paul describe individualistic understanding of God and the universal understanding of God alike. There seems to be a simultaneous narrowing and expanding of God's actions throughout the history, moving between the particular and the universal. God called a single individual in Abraham and promised to bless the entire world through him. There's a progressive expansion in God's promise. God vowed to make Abraham a nation, with Paul describing him as the father of many nations. And we then read that all the people of the earth will be blessed through Abraham. And later, Paul goes on to describe Abraham again as the father of us all. So through one particular person, God enacted his universal embrace for all of humanity. It is interesting that whilst the Bible contains much about politics of the day, it really isn't interested in politics at all. Rather, it seems to present the reader with an anti-political perspective, which is really quite a radical thought. If God is sovereign, then Caesar is secondary. That's dangerous stuff. The prophets, for example, were poets, 
writing about social justice, which was seen as one of the most important forms of, of public speech within Israel. However, they were never political activists. It seems that politics isn't deemed as great value, not a way of life. It isn't central or important to the fulfilling of the human existence. In place of radical, relativised politics, the people of God are called to a way of life that is welcoming to all. A way of life that puts people over power. A way of life that characterised in Micah 6 and 8 to do justice, to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God. To protect the weak, to feed the poor, to free the slaves and to welcome those who are different from ourselves. These are all ways of life that are in stark contrast to the most, how most would live, both in ancient times and in the modern society. The Sovereign God calls for each one of us to be a part of this larger community that is characterised by this relationship that exists between people, based on shared experiences and shared feelings. In other words, we trust ourselves to God alone, and in relationships we are responsible for one another. As we draw towards the celebration of the Eucharist, we gather together at the foot of the sanctuary, we share in the open table, inviting young and old alike, those who have known Jesus for a long time and those who are just starting on the journey with him. God welcomes all, strangers and friends. His love for us all is strong and it's never ending. The lesson that we receive in Acts 10 and 11 from Peter is that Abraham's God of the Jews shows no favouritism, but rather he welcomes all. How radical is that divine message of inclusivity? It's so radically inclusive that even the ritually impure Gentiles and the pagan idolaters are invited to become part of the people of God. And it's in this vocation of God's people to reflect his character in this way by welcoming all people everywhere. Working in partnership with fellow pilgrims on the journey recognising that indeed we are not what we ought to be, but dedicated in this pursuit of holiness regardless. Our unity gives us this freedom to offer hospitality with reckless abandon as a demonstration of humanity in every place recreated in Christ. I think that's something we're doing pretty well as a United Church here in Calandria, offering ourselves in service to God. Shall we pray? Mighty God, we're so grateful for the gifts that you have given to us. We're so grateful for all that you have done in showing us how we should be living our lives. Lord, we thank you for those who have gone before, for those who have shown us the way. Lord, help us to understand how we might be your light here in Calandra. Help us to be shaped by your spirit as we determine the ways forward that we can serve you in the mission that you have set before us. Lord, as we continue to worship together, dwell with us, fill us with your spirits, and help us to understand who we are in you. Amen. As we journey with Jesus, we have uh, to trust in our faith, and especially in the challenging times of our lives, we can take courage that God is always with us on the journey, making himself known to us and to those in their times of brokenness. Let's pray. God of all creation, you have loved this, our ancient land, long before humans knew it, existed or explored it. We thank you for the diversity of the country and its people. We are moved by its magnificent mountains, its verdant valleys and pastoral plains for the riches of its mines and agricultural lands and for the beauty of the forests, lakes and rivers. We thank you for the first Australians who know and love this continent with an innate and profound sensitivity. We acknowledge the courage and the sacrifice of the early settlers and we celebrate the diversity of races that now call Australia home. 
we celebrate too the unique flora and fauna of the country. Forgive us when we are like wombats, hiding in the dark burrows rather than people of the light. Forgive us when we are like galahs, making so much noise that we can't hear the cries of the lost or wounded. Forgive us when we are like bowbirds, so busy collecting the pretty possessions that we miss the wonders around us. Forgive us when we are like inquisitive emus and quick to take flight and run. Give us the grace to emulate the tranquility of kangaroos in the shade of a gum tree, the cheerfulness of, of the laughing kookaburras and playful dolphins. And give us the courage we need to be the best we can be. We thank you for the church in Australia. Inspire us to promote the unity of our church as you call us to be as we pray for all the congregations and our leaders. We pray for all levels of government and for all the and, and for all in authority. We pray that they may govern wisely and justly so that all may live in peace and safety. And as we meet this sacred meet in this sacred place this morning, we pray for the needs of the whole world, for the peace and goodwill of all the earth. We pray for countries ravaged by war, famine, fire or floods. Look with mercy on all whom great sorrow has come through war or tragedy. Help those who are injured and support those who are dying. Console and protect those who have lost family or friends and give light to those who despair. We only need to turn our TVs on and read our papers each morning to see the world torn apart by divisions and strife. Lead all those in authority back into the way of peace to heal what is damaged and to unite what has been torn asunder. In all lands, we remember the unloved, the aged, the little children and the sick in mind and body. We pray for ourselves and for each other. Give us a vision of what we are capable of becoming under your Holy Spirit's guiding. As Jesus changed water into wine at the wedding in Cana, we ask you to transform us so that despite being ordinary people, we become capable of doing extraordinary things. Give us all the courage to affirm, affirm the values of faith, integrity and love and to proclaim the sure and certain hope that these sacred ideas of yours will triumph and endure. In your great mercy, Lord, hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
meet in the name of Christ. Let us share in his peace. The peace of the Lord be with you. The table of bread and wine is now made ready. It is a table of the company of Jesus and with all those who love him. Beloved God, you spread before us this table of plenty and give us the cup of new life to drink. Receive all we offer this day with our grateful thanks and praise. Amen. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Indeed, it is right to give thanks and praise, O God. Out of chaos and darkness, you have created light and abundance of life. From the depths of winter, the new life of spring, and the warmth of summer, you have brought forth the harvest of bounty. Your world is indeed good. Through your Son, who lived and toiled and wept and laughed among us, you were one with us in human flesh. You sent your Spirit to bring new life and to tired bones and souls, causing life-giving water to spring up from dry, thirsty places and putting a new song upon our lips. So together, we join with all the people on earth and all the company of the heavens as we sing to you a hymn of unending praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. So it is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Glory and honour to you, God of life, for the gift of Jesus our Lord. Christ is the first fruit of your creation, with you before him, before time, bringing all to the completion through his death on the cross. By your power you raised him. Evil can never overcome your love. You set us free to be your body, serving this world. On the night before he died, knowing that his time had come, while at supper with his friends, the disciples, Jesus took bread, giving thanks. He broke it, saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink this, all of you. This is the blood of my new covenant. It is poured out for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sins, do this in remembrance of me. We do now what Christ taught us. We remember his death and resurrection, and we look forward to the day when all will be complete in him. We offer thank ourselves and all that we are, our gifts and our talents, our strengths and our weaknesses, to the glory and honour of your name. Christ is the bread of life. Merciful God, send us now in kindness your Holy Spirit to settle upon this bread and this wine and bless them with the fullness of Jesus. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil, for the power and the glory. is broken for the life of the world. Lord, unite us in this sign. This is the table of the Lord, not of the church, but of God. It is made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little. Come, not because it is I who invite you, but because it is the Lord. It is he 
and his word, that those who want to come and meet here. The blood and the body of Christ is here open for all. As we share in communion, I invite you to come uh, from your seats to the back of the hall and down the middle aisle. There'll be servers on either side, and those of you who uh, require to stay in your seats, there'll be servers coming around to you. Come, the table is open. <coughs> gratitude for this moment, for this meal, for these people, we give ourselves to you. Take us out to lives as changed people because we have shared the living bread and cannot remain the same. Enable us to be all that you call us to be so that many will be encouraged through us. Lord, may we live to your glory now and forever. Amen. As we prepare ourselves to leave this place, let us share in the blessing that we've received from God and our faith uh, is still yet to come. As we sing our next hymn, these are things that we are reminded of. Let's join together as we sing. The Spirit send us out to serve. Go in peace, knowing that God will always be by your side in all that you do. Go in love, offering healing and hope to others. Go in joy that others may be lifted and inspired in service. Amen.